Uh, my name is Dodo Tampapile. I teach economics in the school. Please don't hold that against me. Uh, <laughs> It is both my privilege and my pleasure to introduce you to Professor Matthias Ruth, who I got to know somewhere around the mid-90s, 1990s. Uh, he was a young man then. Uh, he still looks young. Uh, despite his youth at that time, he was a very intellectually mature person, uh, and he still continues to be that mature person. Uh, I can go on talking about Matthias, but you are not here to listen to me talk about Matthias, but you are here to listen to Matthias talk to you. Uh, but one thing that he is well known for is uh, systems modeling, and those of you who've done systems modeling and heard of this program called Stella, uh, he was the architect behind that. And the other notable achievement that he has done, for which uh, most of us in environmental economics are grateful for, is the establishment of this Journal of Ecological Economics. Now, without holding any further, I'll pass you on to Matthias. Well, th thanks everyone for being here. Um, I have to say I'm very pleased to see so many people come to a talk that starts with the word entropy, um, which either means um, that you don't really know what entropy is, <laughs> or, or there is something in it that you, that you actually might find of relevance. And what I'm trying to do over the course of the next roughly 45 minutes is to actually try to explain to all of you who may not really know what it is about, what it is about, and uh, why it's relevant. And for all of you who already know about it, uh, give you sort of my take, and I'm trying to be actually a little bit provocative, trying to give you my take of the role of the entropy law, laws of thermodynamics in general in economic decision making. So here's what I'm going to do to start with. So the first roughly 10-15 minutes I want to actually spend sort of laying out in a very so structured way the two different worldviews. The one from physics or more specifically thermodynamics which is the discipline that deals with the transformation of materials and energy from one form in another, which basically means all natural processes sort of are governed by the laws of thermodynamics. So I'll spend a little time on that and then contrast this with the way in which economists think about systems and processes and sort of put them side by side. And then once we've done that, then I want to talk a little bit more specifically about thermodynamics and the entropy law in particular, why we should be concerned with it. And then last but not least, I'll actually being at a policy school here, want to uh, draw some policy implications out of all of that. And those are policy implications of a real world policy, but it also goes a little deeper to what it means to do economics as a basis for policy decision making, for policy analysis. So. Typically, an engineer, a physicist, a thermodynamicist would start with system boundaries before they do anything, before they describe what the processes are about and how they transform materials and energy. And there are typically three kinds of systems that are distinguished. There are isolated systems. These are the ones where neither material or energy crosses the system boundaries. Then there are closed systems where energy can cross the boundaries, but material doesn't. So a closed, an example of a closed system would be, for example, our globe. So if you take away sort of the odd satellite that we shoot out into outer space or the odd meteorite that falls onto the Earth, you know, these are really small quantities in mass terms compared to the Earth itself. So if you, you know, you can think of the Earth really as a closed, materially closed system. And then there are open systems where materials and energy both you know, leave, come and go through the system boundaries. It's really important to have those three different kinds of systems in mind to very carefully define what the laws are of physics, of thermodynamics that apply to them. Because different laws have different meanings based on the system that you use. So if you have an isolated system, for example, or a closed system, if you have a closed system, mass will always be constant in that system. Like on the globe, for all intents and purposes, the mass is constant. If you have an isolated system, that also the energy will be constant, because by definition, no energy crosses the system boundary. So inside the system, the amount of energy is always constant. The closed system assumption for the Earth, for example, has very clear implications for environmental problems in general. That means all the stuff that is there 
will always be there in one form or another. So materials that can transform from one form or another will always be there, typically at the end of a process, as a waste product. In order to bring them back into the system and sort of reduce their wastefulness, recycle them, for example, reuse them, requires energy to be drawn into that system. But the stuff is always around. Very important to keep in mind. So it's not that you, know, you can get rid of it. You've got to, at the beginning, think about what to do with it after its useful life. And so there are a very large number of uh, systems implications, material use and recycling implications of the first law of thermodynamics, the set, uh, and which is the uh, conservation of mass and energy law. The second law of thermodynamics applies to isolated systems. And it says that in an isolated system, so one where neither material or energy are crossing the system boundaries, the order of the system as natural processes occur will decline. So disorder will increase. So if you have two systems that are brought in contact with each other after a while, mixing will happen, uh, diffusion of energy in the term of friction or heat transfer, all of this will happen and ultimately once you start it out with some ordered system, ultimately we'll end up with sort of an, a disordered system. And at that point at which maximum disorder is reached, we typically talk of heat death, meaning no process can occur anymore because there are no gradients in the system that help drive any new processes. Of course, the real world the Earth is not an isolated system. So thank goodness we are getting permanently an influx of energy that helps us to sort of separate out all of those things that are being dispersed throughout the process. But what we do in economic processes is really increase, typically, increase order on the basis of the energy that we can draw on. Right now, to a very large extent, we draw on the energy that has been accumulated in fuels and biomass, uh, but once we're sort of depleting those resources, increasingly we need to transfer over our energy systems to those that are much more sustainably using the influx of solar and wind and, and other perpetually available resources. So if you take this little chart, you know, think of it um, as an example for a mining operation that takes the ore out of the ground so that it was somewhat dissipated materials in the ground. We take that out and we create, let's say, iron ore, so it's a little bit more concentrated when, than what you find in the Earth's crust. And then through mining and smelting and refining processes, you create ever more order in the system, in the economy. And a lot of the economic processes are really designed to do exactly that and a disproportionately large amount of disorder gets generated. So every time we upgrade the ore to a more and more useful state, we downgrade the resources of energy, for example, used to do this. And ever more disorder is being generated that then ultimately leads to leave the system in the form of waste heat into the atmosphere, into water bodies, into the oceans, into rivers, lakes, streams, and so on. This is in part the reason why we have global climate change, because we are creating ever more waste heat that's ultimately being trapped actually inside the atmosphere. And I'll come back to this later. In the 1960s and 70s, Ilya Prigozhin and another sort of a group of researchers around him have studied in fair detail how order can get generated out of disorder. And virtually all natural processes are focused on that. So the biomass that you see out there, the beautiful plants, the trees, the living systems, they are really very much distinguishable from the rest of sort of the average concentration of materials that are out there. They are beautiful, they are different, they are ordered. But I want to make a point that not all economic and natural processes have the goal of creating order. Some of them actually have the goal of creating disorder. Uh, I suspect some of you in here like milkshakes or smoothies, right? Uh, if you want to do this, I think the ideal milkshake wouldn't be one where you have the milk and let's say a banana floating in it and some ice cream floating in it. No, the most desirable milkshake would be the one where everything's mixed very nicely together, right? So I want to make that point that it's really important to recognize that not all 
that it's not the purpose of all economic processes to create disorder, but in some cases, actually the goal is to create disorder. But creating that disorder also requires creating even more disorder in the environment in terms of the energy and other materials that you need in, uh, in order to do this. So that's one important recognition. Another important recognition is that when we're talking about energy and materials sort of and, and efficiency uh, trade-offs, there, there are lots of other trade-offs that we need to think about when we describe from a physical perspective what the economy or economic processes are doing. And here's a little sort of triangle that goes back to a guy called Daniel Sprang. He was at the ETH in Zurich in, in Switzerland, an engineer and physicist. And his point was that, yeah, we could become ideally efficient, perfectly efficient, if we approached very slow process, if we were very, very carefully conducting these uh, transformations of energy and materials in, a, in an orderly, in an organized way. So the laws of thermodynamics actually tell you that the slower a process occurs, the more careful you are, the less waste products you generate. As a matter of fact, all of you know about this. You have heard about the usual phrase that, you know, haste makes waste. Well, the faster things occur, the more waste get generated. So there's a trade-off between the energy waste and the material waste on the one hand and the time it takes to carry out a process. And so it's one part of this triangle. And the other one, the I, stands for information. If you have more information when you know exactly where the waste products go, then it's much easier to collect them back and bring them back into the system. And so real world processes have a particular speed, they have a particular efficiency, and they have a particular embodied information or knowledge uh, that describes them. And if we increase the knowledge about them, then we can speed them up, or we can become more efficient, or maybe even both. And so there is this trade-off, not just what the engineers typically were thinking about, energy and material conversions, but it's really energy, information, and time that are always traded off against each other in economic processes. And obviously, that makes an econo uh, that makes an physical analysis of transformation processes even more complicated and difficult uh, to carry out. So, so much on so some basic physics, how engineers and thermodynamicists think about material and energy conversion. Uh, now, to a somewhat different way of looking at the world, and it's the economist's way of looking at the world. And here, typically, we also start with systems, so a usual uh, model, you know, some of the oldest economic models going back to Adam Smith, identified firms and households, producers and consumers, and identified the relationships between them, sort of like the systems that we describe in the engineering process. And then the exchanges are not materials and energy, sort of in a generic form, but really it's labor, it's capital, it's land, that the households hold that, may, that are made available to the firms to then produce desired products that go back to the households. And so you have what's known as a circular flow model. And if you want to describe the economy in that way, it's really tedious because there are shoes and there are VCRs and there are iPods and there are who knows what kinds of products that you all need to keep track of. But life gets so much easier if you just look at the monetary flows that connect the two systems. Right? So households give up labor to firms, but in return they get wages and for the other productive services that they provide, they get interest payments, they get rents and so on. And the firms sort of a counter flow to the products that they generate and make available to the households get in return a monetary flow of purchases, right? This is sort of the standard economic model. Nothing, nothing new and exciting about this. This little model uh, you know, sort of describes you know, the thinking of you know, 18th century economists, but you know, as Adam Smith already back then pointed out, it's really difficult with this understanding to describe how economies grow how they develop, how they structurally change. And in order to do this, you really need another sector in there that temporarily can hold some of the excess resources, some of the savings that are made available by households, and then give them out as loans, for example, to firms so that they can build up their capital stock, so that they can produce more goods and services, so that they can hire more labor, and then can provide more wages and more interest payments and more rents and so on, which then stimulates the demand for the products that are generated. That's what's known as Say's Law, right? And so you have an expanded circular economy that now with this sort of mindset actually can help describe in a fairly 
sophisticated way how economies grow and develop. And that really is sort of the fundamental basis of a lot of the economics, macroeconomics, that we still use today, you know, 200 years later. Um, and, you know, we do this in an everyday sort of um, analyses. Uh, so if countries calculate their GDP, you know, it's typically, you know, the value of all the production that goes on in these two different sectors, you know, producers and consumers. Um, and in this case, you know, I sort of gave you a little, you know, this is from the 1980s that tells you how old I am. So one of my old textbooks, uh, a little description of how you would calculate, for example, the value that's get that's generated through production, right? And so you have, let's say, a farming operation, that's the wheat production, you know, let's say $15 you pay for that. And then out of this, ultimately, you know, the wheat goes to mills to make flour, you know, the value of that is $40. And then bread production, and then ultimately the bread gets sold to consumers, and then, you know, at the price of 85 for you know, a certain quantity. So that's how we sort of calculate this one way to calculate GDP ultimately, that we look at all of these different levels of production and look at the end and say, well, this is the value of all the goods and services. Or you can do this on a value added basis. You can say, well, the value added in wheat production was 15. The value added then at the flour production was 25 and so on. And then at the end, if you sum these all up, on the value added basis, you need to come up, you know, sort of an identity here with the final value of the product. This is all trivial, I know this, but I put this up here because I want to ask you what's wrong with this? Is there anything wrong with this? Well, when I say is there anything wrong with this, it sounds like a rhetorical question, right? So the environment, where the soils, the water, the atmosphere, all of which make possible the growth of wheat, has no value associated with it, right? Never shows up here. It's really the moment, it's all the things that the farmers do that has value, that adds value. The environment adds no value to this. So in some sense, the way in which we set up our economic model and the way in which we set up our accounting of what creates value in the economy, at the very beginning, in a very basic definitional way, excludes a lot of the contributions that the environment makes to it. And obviously, if you sort of think ahead of where we are today, uh, there might be a problem with this. Another so interesting way in which economists think about production is through production functions. And I wrote down here, you know, one of the basic ones that all of you must have seen at one point or another. It's known as a cup duckless production function. So on the left hand side, you have the output, a quantity of output Q, and then it's a function of the capital and the labor that goes into the production process. And then there are little parameters, the A that sort of helps you convert the units and tells you something about the efficiency, and then parameters alpha and beta. If you want to think of this as Q as the output of a whole economy like GDP, and the alphas and betas are in essence the factor shares of the income uh, of capital and labor in your economy. And then the A tells you something about the efficiency of how capital and labor get converted into output ultimately. That's also very trivial. And you can illustrate this. You could say, hey, you know, this is like producing a cake. You know, you need the labor, the cooks, you need the oven, that's a capital, and then out comes the product, the cake. I'll ask the same question. What's wrong with that? Have you ever tried to bake a cake with just an oven? Right? It's really difficult, right? So you could obviously, you need materials, right? You need eggs, you need flour, you need all kinds of other stuff that goes into a cake, sugar and so on. Right? And so what many economists have done, once they recognize, oops, yes, materials are really important here, they have expanded their production functions in ways to account for the materials in just the same way in which they have accounted for capital and labor. Okay? And so you just put those in there and have a little own its exponent, call it gamma, and then you proceed with the same kind of analyses that you have before. Which is also problematic. Alfred North Whitehead, the philosopher of science, you know, referred to this as the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. You take one model that works perfectly fine for one setting, like material, uh, sorry, uh, financial flows of capital and labor and the financial aspects associated with production output. And now you sort of stick something else in there and use the same instrument to do the analysis to which it really wasn't designed. And why there is a problem, I want to illustrate with the example, let's say, 
if your cook doesn't have enough time, let's say you can only hire them for half the time, and maybe you only have half the eggs, half the flour, and half the milk. What this equation tells you is, well, it's not a problem if you have, let's say, twice the number of ovens, you can substitute for the lack of inputs of some of the others. They are substitutable, right? And of course they are not. But we're proceeding with our analyses as if they were, right? And I think there's a problem. I suspect you recognize there's a problem. So there is that basic issue with the economic description of production processes. And I'll come back to you know, the physics behind this you know, in a few minutes. Uh, but then there's another problem. Uh, Robert Solo, you know, one of the most famous economists, Nobel laureates, uh, you know, developed what's now known as Solo's growth model, which in essence back then started, and there are now much more sophisticated versions of this, but started with the same kind of cop douglas production function that I showed before, and then it specifically accounted also for the capital accumulation that I showed you in the uh, uh, little circular uh, economy model earlier. And so the notion is that yes, we can save, put some of our income away as savings that then can get used to invest in new capital, which then ultimately as labor and the capital stock grows, can also lead to an increase in economic output. And uh, you can make these investments almost like a perpetual motion machine. You can create more output that then allows for more savings, which then allows for more investments, which then allows for more output. It happens all by itself, as if materials and energy, again, were not an issue at all. Right? And so we still today think that we can sustainably grow our economy, meaning not drawing, on resources, on materials, stocks, and not drawing them down while continuing to increase the economy. And most of that thinking really goes back to, in this case, sort of a model that was developed in the 1970s, 19, late 1960s and early 1970s. But there are other versions of that kind of thinking that are much more contemporary. Some of you might have heard of so-called environmental Kuznets curves, right? The Kuznets curve itself, you know, goes back to um, a Russian statistician and uh, sociologist who actually sort of find, found statistical relationships between the development of an economy and income inequality. The same kind of thinking was applied to environmental issues where people said, well, you know, if the per capita GDP goes up, so if on average we get all a little richer, then ultimately the environmental harm that we do will be able to be reduced. So economies on the left-hand side, and you know, the early analyses sort of did this just as a cross-sectional uh, approach, the early analyses sort of said, well, you know, there are some economies, the ones on the, with the red dots here, that are on the left-hand side of this curve, and they have uh, low GDP per capita, and they have low environmental harm that they do. And then on the right-hand side, you know, the green one, you know, we find those with high income per capita, high GDP per capita, and we find that their environmental harm is also low. And so the notion is and was, and still to some extent that, that is around and is, is driving policy by the World Bank and by many others, is to say, well, all we need to do is make sure that the ones on the left increase their income and by doing so move to the right and reduce the environmental impact that they have. There are so many problems with that kind of thinking. For one, it assumes that the economies on the left can go through the same kind of transition that, for example, Europe in the, 19, uh, in the 18 and 1900s did. Right? None of this really happens. The demographic transition processes, the economic transition is all fundamentally different. So it assumes that we can all sort of mimic those countries that already moved ahead in that curve. But it also, on a much deeper level, assumes, if you really think about this, it assumes that growing the economy can help solve the problems that are caused by growing the economy. It's a little bit of a contradiction in here, right? But nevertheless, that is sort of the kind of thinking that to a very large extent drives you know, international development uh, agendas uh, from, from a monitor or from, from a financial perspective. Also, just as an aside, 
for what I mentioned earlier, the way we calculate GDP, the environment has absolutely no contribution to it. So there is an issue to this. And in general, GDP is really not a good indicator of development. It's really just an indicator of economic output, right? And so uh, analyses that have been carried out to actually look at indicators that are much more closely related to actual development cannot find any of these relationships. No big surprise. If you take resources into account, if you take material use into account, if you take real development into account, none of these curves really exist. So there goes the basis for a lot of, uh, sorry, for a lot of environment, uh, for a lot of economic and development policy. I don't want to be too critical about economics. I'll come back to you know, all the great contributions, but there is one more point that I want to make, a couple more quick points that one of the key instruments that economists talk about is the price as a signal to consumers and producers what to do. Right? If the price goes up, there is an incentive to produce more of a product, and then if, produce, if consumers buy more of it, uh, then they will drive up the price, and then there is an incentive to produce more, and so on. Or if the price goes down, then you decide to produce less. So there are these movements along the demand and the supply curves, and likewise, there are movements that can happen because, for example, your income changes. So if the income goes up, you might now be willing to pay a higher price for the same quantities. Right? This is all standard, basic, introductory microeconomics. But while the laws of thermodynamics earlier that I mentioned you know, really tell you there is no reversibility, you cannot ever go back up and down all the time without expending more energy and more materials, the traditional economic thinking assumes that you can sort of increase the income or decrease the income and you move back and forth between these you know, equilibrium points. So again, there is a mismatch between what we know from the laws of physics about the real physical relationships and how we produce and consume, and there is something very different in the way in which we describe consumption and production decisions from the economic perspective. And I just want to leave that there for a moment. Uh, I also want to make a very important point that even if prices could allow you to provide these signals, they are really not just a construct of production and consumption. Prices really, as all of you know, are also a product of the social discourse of uh, social structures of uh, power relationships within society and you know this little picture sort of illustrates how one part of society gets encroached on by another but the ones you know people and their livelihoods that are represented on the right hand side many of their activities are not reflected in the marketplace and therefore their decisions are not reflected in the price mechanism while most of what's happening on the left probably is. And so by virtue of having a society structured in a way that many of the decisions don't make it on the marketplace, the market price by itself is only a very basic indicator of what could or should happen on the market itself. Right? And so keeping these social con that social context in mind is going to be really important too. And then last but not least, a lot of what the economic instruments have done up to date is really help identify the efficient use of scarce resources. How do we allocate scarce resources across you know, different alternatives? In the case of the country you know, where I live right now, in the United States, this and many other places too has led to highly concentrated activities, very large, so trying to you know, capitalize on economies of scale, very large operations like power uh, supply systems, like very large power plants that then get plopped here and there in the landscape across the country and then over long distance supply uh, electricity to my house and everyone else. Uh, very efficient, but not robust. What we now find, and you know, I, envy you for your beautiful weather out there. I still have about a meter and so, or so of snow in front of my house. What we find is downing of power lines. Uh, what we find is uh, power interruptions. Uh, many of these uh, outcomes of the efficiency decision making really don't uh, have a long-term impact on the robustness of the system. We are becoming ever more brittle, ever more um, focused on doing more with fewer resources rather than generating, for example, redundancies. 
there is very little in the economic instrument box, toolbox, that leads you to develop redundancies. There is a lot in there to help identify these efficiencies, which obviously then can have long-term sustainability challenges associated with it. And then last but not least, on that point of long-term sustainability challenges, when economists try to describe what we should do today to become sustainable over the long term, uh, is really focused towards an identification of investment and policy decisions today that then play out over a long period of time, as if we would know the entire time horizon over which, for example, we extract resources. So this is a little graphic from Hotelling's model on the optimal extraction of scarce resources that goes back to the 1930s that really still, to a very large extent, determines the way in which we decide on resource extraction processes today. The decision is made at one point in time over an entire time horizon as if everything were known. The previous set of charts should indicate not everything is known. Climate change, social change, economic change, political change, all of these are unknowns that are fundamental to economic decision making that really are not adequately represented in many of the instruments that we use for economic analysis. How do you bring them together? That's a real big challenge. And not, I have some answers to that, but not all of those. But the ones that I have, I do want to share with you. And then the rest, it's really a research agenda for many people uh, and probably for many years to come. So let me come back to the entropy law. You know, why is it relevant? Why should we concern ourselves with this? And here are just a few sort of quick observations. Um, the production function that I mentioned earlier, sort of a cup ductless or any other, almost any other type of production function, you know, we typically sort of, you know, I, I talked about you know, substitutability. So we typically have a few sort of data points on labor consumption and uh, labor use and material use. So we have a few data points along these curves and then we interpolate and we extrapolate and we get these nice mathematical formulas onto which we then can unload our mathematical instruments to do an analysis. And so what we typically do then is you know, derive these production, production functions. So here is an isoquant for one of those. Um, nice little curves that show us what these trade-offs are. If you begin to take into account the physical constraints on production processes, these curves might look very different. So we know that, for example, to make a ton of steel, you need, at a minimum, a ton of materials to go into this. As a matter of fact, you need more than a ton, significantly more than a ton, almost close to two tons of materials if you count the coke and the oxygen that you draw in and, and on and on. So there are minimum material requirements that constrain the production process, none of which are typically in, taken into account in traditional economic production models, which can totally change the analysis. And a lot of the work that uh, Dodo referred to that I've done in the 1980s and 90s really was to impute physical laws into production um, theory, basically, of economics to make these uh, descriptions much more realistic. Uh, so that's one way to do this, sort of take the physical insights, adjust the functional forms to then arrive at a description that's much more meaningful. That's actually consistent with the laws of thermodynamics. Um, over time, uh, what we often do in, in economics is say, well, you know, we become more efficient, we become more, less material intensive, and so we have learning curves. So we'll start out with sort of, you know, let's say at one point in time or one level of cumulative production, a certain material intensity, and then we have a few more data points, and then we'll use those with statistical analyses and we project out into the future what the ultimate in the long term material efficiencies would look like. And you see this, you know, for a lot of different technologies, you know, semiconductor industries, you know, have these nice little learning curves. Uh, you get them for the steel and paper and cement industry, you name it. So they're all out there and they're all based on, you know, this kind of thinking. If you take into account the fact that you have material requirements that cannot be surpassed, or energy requirements that cannot be surpassed, then you have another constraint on the system that then can change fundamentally your long-term outlook on how efficient you can become. Let me just give you one little example. Power generation, the picture that I showed you earlier, highly centralized power generation from fossil fuels. The efficiency of this is about 43%. 43.12 is the average in the United States. It was 43.11 in the 1970s. It hasn't really changed, right? If you take the overall 
second law efficiency. So if you take all the qualitative changes of materials and energy into account of the whole US economy, do you want to venture guess how efficient the whole economy as such is? I'm not going to point at people, but it's about 2%. So work by Robert Ayers showed that if you take into account all the materials and energy that get cranked through the system and all the disorder that you generate along the way, on net, about two to two and a half, depends on how you look at it. That's our efficiency. And that really hasn't changed a lot in roughly the last 20 or 30 years either. So these physical constraints are real. And projecting out into the future what can happen and what we should do about it, um, you know, is significantly influenced by this. Another really important point I want to make is that the economics, and th there's nothing fundamentally wrong with sort of doing economics if, if you make sure that it's actually consistent with the physical world within which we live. But what we typically do is really focus only on the wanted, on the desired products that we generate. The production function that I showed you earlier is the quantity of desired output. Right? Nothing in there tells you anything about the undesired output. And so what a number, an increasing number of people are now doing is supplementing those production functions, those descriptions of what the economy is doing with material balances, with energy balances, with second law balances. And of course, this gets ever more complicated. Many of you have had economics before, right? Suffered maybe through your microeconomics, probably thought this was really all very hard and complicated. And now there comes this guy and tells you, okay, this is good. Uh, but now you have to take into account the physical laws as well. And you have to create accounting balances for this as well. It doesn't get any easier. But if you want to do economics in a way that's cognizant of and respectful of the real world physical constraints on the material side and on the waste side, there is no other way unless you want to forget about all the unwanted byproducts. So what the economics that we usually do really focuses on is really just one small part of the system. My good old friend Herman Daly uh, s likes to refer to as the economy as a wholly owned subsidiary of the ecosystem. There is no way of thinking about the economy without actually thinking about where all the materials and energy come from and where all the waste products ultimately go to. The question is how do you do an economics, how do you do a policy analysis in a way that is consistent with this broader context that really takes into account resource use, energy use, waste generation, recycling, the influx of solar heat, and then the outflux of waste heat back into space. How do you do this? It becomes much more complicated. Okay? And I have a few ideas and I want to share with you a few sort of policy implications of this. But before I do this, I want, let me actually go back to this. So look at this picture, just so sort of take it in for a second. Okay? And then I want to show you sort of a different notion of how we balance the economy with society and with the environment that many of you might have heard of before, the so-called triple bottom line. You hear this a lot in the business world, in the business context, where people say, well, to become sustainable means to do right by the business agenda, right, to grow your business, but to do this in a way that we are mindful of the social context within which we do this. We, f we provide fair labor, we provide clean working environments, healthy work, safe working environments, and we become ever more efficient and so we're doing right by the economy as well. So the triple bottom line is one where we're good with regard to social, economic, and environmental issues, and we become ever better in this. I don't have a fundamental problem with that kind of thinking, but what it typically turns out, first, on a fundamental level, it still sort of assumes that there's a lot of the economy that can happen without society or without the environment, and, and vice versa, right? So there's sort of a fundamental um, conceptual problem. But then there's sort of a real world problem if you focus on doing them all sort of separately and not really thinking about a nested system where the economy is part of a society which is part of an ecosystem. If you do it in a different way, you can fall into a variety of different traps. And I sort of listed three here. One is what's referred to as the rebound effect. Focusing increasingly on efficiency, making things more efficient. I'm not against this, but what it typically means is that we use the efficiency gain really as a gain in disposable income. If your car is more efficient, you buy less fuel, you have a little bit more money available, what do you do with this? Maybe you drive a little more, 
Maybe you eat out more often. Maybe you buy a new shirt. Maybe you buy a new tie. Whatever it is, you do something that also requires energy. Right? This is what's referred to as the rebound effect. At a large scale, if you grow your economy, and you can do this because you become ever more efficient, then you have more resources to grow the economy. Right? And oftentimes that goes at the expense of society and or the environment. Another trap that we often think about, uh, or that we fall into, is that we say, well, all we need to do is, in you know, developing countries, instead of having to go through the whole tedious and arduous development process that you know, England and Germany and you know, Europe and so on have gone through in the 18 and 1900s, they can sort of technologically leapfrog. And the example that we often hear is of Africa, where no one's putting landlines into the ground for telecommunication, right? It's all cellular based, right? We're jumping one or more of these development stages that we have seen elsewhere. So that's a leapfrogging argument. Well, if you go around the world and you look at what kind of leapfrogging typically happens, is we leapfrog immediately into technologies, into production and consumption patterns that are much more energy intensive and much more material intensive. Right? And so the efficiency improvement and the leapfrogging typically don't help but just increase the size of the economy at the expense of everything else. Which in the long run, if you recognize that there are these fundamental biophysical constraints, will really be a problem. And then the last point that I make here is about default setting is that our whole system is set up to reward that kind of approach. Look, here I am arguing for a world in which we are mindful to these economic systems and I can tell you my retirement payments are directly tied to the performance of the stock market. So on the one hand I'll tell you economic growth is really not what we should be pushing for. We really should be pushing for development and qualitative changes and improvements and so on. On the one hand, I'll tell you this, but I can also admit that when I look at my monthly return on my stock portfolio, which pays my retirement in you know, 20, 30, or whenever years, right, that I want growth, right? So we have this schizophrenic system set up where we sort of increasingly recognize these constraints, and people like myself and many others sort of begin to help shape the policy to move in that direction. But the default setting, what really provides a reward system, is still one that's arguably you know, growth-oriented, material throughput-oriented, and ultimately not sustainable. Right? So that's a bit of a challenge. If not, at a minimum, it's sort of a moral challenge that I face. Uh, so what does all of this mean? What does all of this mean so for everyday sort of policy and, and action? Okay? And I have a few sort of quick ways of summarizing sort of the, the grand sort of theoretical perspectives from thermodynamics and economics and some of these observations of where they lead us to, to really sort of help think about a different world and hopefully bring about a different world that's much more sustainable than what we currently have. So the first two points are the following. And the, the first is actually sort of an equivalent. In economics, you know, going back to Friedman, we often say there is no free lunch, right? The physicists or thermodynamics, thermodynamicists would say, hey, there's no perpetual motion. So we need to recognize that whatever we do has a consequence and in many cases, the economist would say, well, on the margin, the, mar the cost and the benefits, the marginal cost and the benefit need to equalize each other. Well, that's when you just talk about monetary terms. But in physical terms, the cost to the rest of the world is typically larger than the benefit that you generate. Thinking about it in those terms sort of means that we need to rethink you know, how we do economics, how we describe, how we define our economic instruments. On a much more fundamental sort of physical level, uh, one implication is that we need to match energy sources to the services that, that we want. I'll give you one little, little example, that's why this picture is here. If you want to heat a room, how do we typically do this? I can tell you where I'm from, where we need a lot of heating of our rooms, uh, in part because the insulation of the houses and so on is so bad. What do we do? We put these big power plants in place that take 
highly concentrated refined materials like oil and gas, combust them, make steam and heat out of them, drive turbines, ultimately generate electricity, which is a highly concentrated movement of electrons basically in your wires, to ultimately heat up a wire in a heater that then moves molecules in the room, lets them bounce around. It's so inefficient. You start with something extremely organized like a fossil fuel, make it more organized like electricity, and then all you want to do is heat the room, so create a little bit more disorder of the material, of the, of the molecules in the room. So what we actually need to do is not take the highly concentrated forms of energy to create ultimately something as disorganized as molecules whizzing around in a room, but to take low quality energy like solar power, build in a different way, organize the buildings in a different way, use lighting, use windows, use the way in which you structure not just the building, but also the morphology of a city to capture what's out there for free to do what you need to do, just heat up the room, right? Why go through all these stages? And again, what thermodynamics tells you, the more stages you have in the process, the more disorder you have to create along the way. This, on the right-hand side here, is a much more immediate way of converting the energy ultimately into a desired service. And there are so many other ways in which this happens. This is a very simple example, but, you know, the production of paints, the design of uh, containers, uh, the labeling of... There are so many different ways in the manufacturing sector that you can think about how you shave off, how you take out intermediate steps to shorten the stages and then through this conserve energy, conserve materials, become more efficient and then become much more sustainable in the long run. I want to go through a little thought experiment coming back to my, my, my schematic from earlier. So trying to think about economics and thermodynamics, how they play hand in hand. But here's the thought experiment. Take the, the thermodynamic ideal, which we all know is not going to happen, but these are processes that are infinitesimally slowly occurring. There is no friction, there is no heat transfer across finite temperature boundaries, there is no inelastic deformation, there is no free expansion, there are all these things that actually make up the real world. Okay? Take these all out of the picture, assume everything gradually and slowly happens, and as that happens, the amount of the, the way in which we degrade energy and release energy and materials back into the environment is very careful, if you wish, it's very slow, it's very mesological, and happens all at ambient concentration. So all the waste heat is at the ambient temperature. All the waste materials get released at the ambient concentrations. So you really have no impact on the environment. You take them from the ambient state, you ultimately return them to the ambient state. Totally ideal. In that ideal, the economic description of a technology is perfectly adequate. Prices can tell you everything about how, scare, how to allocate the scarce resources inside this box. But once you move outside that ideal, where you actually have waste products generated at non-ambient concentrations, then it becomes a little bit more com complicated. This is then where we need science, like physics and biology. That's where we need political institutions to help bound what can and should happen in the United States. We have toxic uh, release inventories that have to be provided by companies. Here you probably have something equivalent in Singapore. There are constraints from the legal perspective to help make sure we know where the stuff is coming from and where it is going. So a little bit outside that physical ideal where we still know what these effluents look like. Political institutions and markets and science together can still provide pretty much all the information that we need. But then you move a little further from that to the case where the effluents are unknown, where we don't know where they go and what they do. And increasingly markets have less of a role to play and the traditional institutions, the way we've designed them, are also having a much harder time to deal with these issues. And it's at that point where we need a whole new approach to bring about sustainability. We need 
social discourse where no longer the efficiency argument or the physics is basic, the physics descriptions, you know, none of these by themselves can tell you what you need to do. What we need is multi-criteria decision making where a lot of these insights are being brought to bear and where society collectively makes choices. And there are lots of beautiful models that have been developed like the Danish consensus models where people come together and with the help of experts as communities make these decisions. And to do this in an adaptive way that they say, well, we don't ever really know today all the things that we need to know for the indefinite future. We will learn as we make these decisions. And we make these decisions on the basis of multiple criteria. And then as we learn, we rethink our decisions, we re-implement. And it becomes very difficult to do this if you think about it the way in which we design our current markets and our current institutions. But if we want to become sustainable, sort of in the long term, maintain the wealth and the quality of life that we have, we need to begin to recognize that many of these effluents have unknown fates and have to be dealt with in a fundamentally different way. And so, and last but not least, what does this mean? So very concrete policy requirements and action. So one of them is that we need to begin to cap what's known as the throughput through the system. There is only so much ultimately from a resource side or from a waste assimilation side that the ecosystem can handle. We need to cap it at the sustainable level. Either we cap the throughput based on the constraints that come from the resource side or the constraints that come from the waste assimilation side, whichever is more binding. Once we have these caps, then within these caps we can auction off to industry, and we do this already uh, in carbon trading markets uh, all around the world, uh, sulfur trading markets and so on. We cap and then we begin to trade these quotas among the interested parties. And then we don't just allocate these quotas, we auction them off, right? It's, it's a common resource that we're really holding as a society that we now let others use, right? So we auction them off and the auction revenue then can be used to create more equitable outcomes. This is one way to bring back the societal component back into the pricing mechanism that I mentioned earlier. And then the trade of these auctions. Then this is where economics really can play a major role. That trade then can lead to efficient outcomes. So that's one way to think about it. A second very concrete policy implication of all of this is to create what's known as an ecological tax reform. Right now, a lot of the taxes get levied on the things that we actually value highly. There's income tax. So we basically tax labor, right? We tax accumulation of capital. Should we? Why don't we tax more instead of the goods, the bads? Tax resource consumption, tax energy depletion, tax waste generation. And one can show you can shift the tax from the goods to the bads in a way that ultimately your quality of life, your tax burden, doesn't change at all. But your quality of life is expressed in the material wealth that's still left out there and the quality of the environment gets shifted significantly if we move from taxing the goods to taxing the bads. And then the, uh, another sort of very important uh, implication going back to some of my earlier comments about GDP, and here's just sort of two little graphs you know, of an analysis that I've done a few years, a couple of years ago. So GDP tells you something about uh, the quantity of output that's generated by economy in a given year, all the market values of all the marketed goods and services, right? But then if you begin to correct this for all the other things that we really value, like income distribution, like um, crime, you know, it's sort of a negative, really. It's not, you know, if crime goes up, more police, you know, more damages, more fixing the damages, GDP goes up. Well, it's not really contributing to our wealth, right? So if you begin to subtract out all the bads and add in to many of the goods for which there is no market value. Household labor, raising your kids at home, uh, having grandparents at that, you know, all of these things that are really valuable where there is no market price. If you begin to value them and add them into it, then the change in the GDP, the output, compared to actually how well off we are, looks very different. And so as a matter of fact, I didn't label them on purpose, but this is for uh, Maryland, the state I've lived in for, for a good 10 years. Uh, fairly recently, this is the line 
for the GDP and it continues to go up. But then if you correct for all the bads, then the real sort of welfare that's being generated in the state is much lower. And you can do this, and people have done this at national levels and international levels. And you see in many cases, especially sort of for Europe uh, and North America, uh, those two curves begin to diverge quite significantly in the 1970s. GDP continued until the financial crisis to really take off. And around the 1980s in most countries, the welfare that we've generated, the quality of life actually flattened out. So which is actually an indicator that we needed ever more stuff to move through the system to just keep us in place in terms of quality of life. Not so good. Um, Another important point I want to make is that we need to begin to develop new criteria. So there is the efficiency criteria in economics. What we really need is sort of a robustness criteria. How well off are we under a wide range of different shocks being put onto the system? And not just optimality, but how robust are we in the long run? Right, so it's efficiency and redundancy, it's uh, optimality and robustness. These are very different concepts. And what's on the left-hand side is what you find in the current economic sinking and policy sinking. And what you find in the right-hand side is really what some countries, some regions, some cities in particular have started to move into, especially with some of the new challenges that they face, like climate change, sea level rise, heat waves, and on and on. And then, last but not least, we need to begin to rethink economics. Right? So far, we thought we defined economics as the discipline that deals with the optimal, optimal allocation of scarce resources to meet the needs of humans. The resources become ever scarcer, the needs become ever larger, and you can begin to think that in a finite world, ultimately you face a challenge. Right? And so this ecological economics that builds on the laws of physics, that takes into account the social context, and then, then on the basis of those brings in economics, sort of as that sort of set of approaches, is a very different one from the one that we currently use. Uh, but as I said, uh, many countries, uh, many regions, many cities around the world are so beginning to rethink this. And with that, I do want to stop here. I want to thank you for your attention. I want to open this to any questions, comments, and particularly challenges and critiques that you might have. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, we, have, uh, we can squeeze in about 20 minutes for Q&A. Uh, so I'll pass the mic around. Anyone who wants to ask a question, please. Uh, we start with. Uh, hey, okay. uh, economists, uh, Donald, uh, economists do have a way of beginning uh, uh, environmental impacts of our production processes. It's called externality. Uh, presumably, you don't think that approach is far enough. Uh, why not? Oh, that's a really good question. I'm glad you asked this. Um, so how do you do this as an economist? Yes, you recognize that there are some harms being done that are not mediated through the marketplace. And then you begin to internalize them through taxes or subsidies or you know, some other kinds of schemes. Um, in principle, there is nothing wrong with this. The challenge is, and I'll just give you one you know, not so small example, um, about carbon emissions. So we have known since the early 1800s that emission of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere creates something that we call now the greenhouse effect. Right? So that's been a known chemical and physical process for a long period of time. Um, in the 1970s and 80s, not just the climate, but also the debate about climate change has sort of heated up. Um, and then comes the Kyoto Protocol, and you know, many nations have signed on to this and beginning to try to figure out ways of internalizing this. 250 years after the Industrial Revolution, where we have begun to heavily input carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and roughly 200 years or so after we've recognized that this process is a physical one, right, and a real one, are we beginning to talk about internalization of externalities? Well after the fact, I have no idea how long it'll take us to actually internalize the externalities, right? So we are probably still decades, if not more, away from it. Who knows what harm has been done? So what you, what you do, this is a long way of saying, what you do in economics with the internalization of externalities, you start out with an approach that is not mindful of the biophysical constraints, you run into a problem, then and you wait for a while for the political process to unfold, right? And then you try to figure out what the price is, and then maybe at some point you make the right decision, 
right? If you begin at the early stage to describe the production process in a way that recognizes, oops, there's carbon coming out at the end, right? And you begin to trace this, right? You have a very different approach to this. And it's not just carbon. I mean, it's mercury. It's, uh, I mean, you name it, right? Uh, it's all kinds of pollutants, uh, all kinds of harms uh, that blindside us in many cases in the economic world. They come sort of like a big surprise, and then we figure out how the marketplace can handle them. And they shouldn't come as a big surprise if you had done the accounting for all the unwanted byproducts at the beginning. Right? Ruben Hintz, a PhD student here at the school. I wanted to push you a little bit more on what you were just saying about the political process. I mean, if we look at fuel subsidies, which all economists basically agree are a horrible policy, it's very difficult for a lot of countries to get rid of them. You know, from a personal level, I've been telling my parents in suburban Maryland to get rid of their cars for 10 years, and they just ignore me. So, you know, what is, is academia? Should we be doing more to try and figure out the political solutions instead of just the economic theory? Yeah, oh, that's actually, I think you have two questions here. I want to first uh, talk a little bit about your parents and their car ownership. <laughs> uh, and, and not just your parents. I mean, in the United States, and you, you are, you're blessed here actually with, with a very different approach to car, car ownership. I mean, you might not think of it as a blessing right now. <laughs> It's very costly, right? But it's also very costly in the United States. It's just, in the case of the United States, the costs are borne by society and the benefits are reaped by the, by the individual, right? And here, you, you, you have people who benefit from it also bear the cost, right? So, to come back to Maryland, or you can take almost any part of the United States, people are in a real tough bind. Um, you won't find support for public transportation or for an increase in fuel prices. You know, people would say, hey, let's, let's check up you know, the price per gallon or per liter of gasoline, and then that gives people, that's the economic argument, that gives people an incentive to switch away from cars into public transportation. We can actually take that tax to invest in public transportation. Well, it takes decades to build up a public transportation network. What you do between now and then is really by increasing the price, you just inflict more pain, right? And then the political process is such that anyone who goes out and says, hey, I'm going to inflict more pain on you today so that in 20 years you may be able to take a bus, right, will not vote for you, and right? And so we are stuck in the United States with a public transportation infrastructure that really resembles Soviet-era style transportation. Uh, not what you would think of as, you know, the 21st century leading, one of the leading economies of the world. But we're stuck in this, and so there is no easy solution to this, right? And it actually, the, the easy solution there is would be one that requires leadership. And that's really hard to find, right? Uh, but not to pick on your parents or anyone else in the United States. The more interest, and, and that's what you actually point towards, the more interesting question really is how to get to this societal consent that something needs to happen. If you look, and I now I can only speak for the US here, that's sort of where most of my, you know, half of my life was spent, most of my, all my economic and sort of policy analysis experience goes toward, or much of it. Uh, the big action in the US actually on climate, on energy, and on infrastructure is actually not at the national level. It's actually also not so much anymore at the state level. It's at the city level. That's where you have immediately the benefit. You see that your bus system gets better. You see that the parking situation gets better. You see that the tro road transportation, that the schools, you know, all of the immediate benefits are immediately recognized by the people who make the decisions and who make the sacrifices. Right? So who are the real leaders right now in the United States, maybe in the world, on environmental policy and on social policy and on uh, economic policy? It's typically not the countries per se, it's the cities, it's the mayors. Some of the most powerful leaders and some of the most visionary leaders are found at the city level. And this, I have to say, is one of the great joys of being in Singapore. You got it both in one place, right? You got the city and you got the nation, right? What a wonderful way of 
showcasing to the world how you can do this, how you can have a clean environment, how you can have high quality of life, how you can have wonderful public transportation, and how you can, for those who want to and can afford it, can have private ownership of cars. Right? But this is where the United States will move in. This is where Europe is halfway there already. That's where Canada is moving towards. That's where at some point the Chinas and the Indias of the world will also move towards. I have absolutely no doubt. And so if you look at the policy process to bring about change, I would look at the city level. I would not, not so much look at the national level. Please, uh, the gentleman here, just press the mic. Yes, um, I'm from the United States originally. I'm happy to be living here. Um, I, I agree with you, the city level should be, but I just want to say that with 60% of the states controlled by retrograde Republicans, uh, who, who with, with willfulness to ignore any issue of the environment, I, I really think that pessimistic about pretty much at the state level. Um, yeah, so, it, so, it, uh, so coming back to the United States, um, yes, I, I sort of have given up hope to some extent too that anything will happen at the national level. Uh, within the states, uh, if you look on climate action, for example, 37 of the 50 states have a climate action plan and are fairly aggressively pursuing those. Uh, some of those even have you know, climate adaptation plans. Uh, if you look at cities, over 500 cities in the United States, the mayors have uh, uh, implemented or beginning to implement climate action plans. So it's just one example where cities really are moving very rapidly forward. Um, at the national level, this is such a big country with so much diversity, with so many conflicting interests. Finding a compromise there um, is somewhat hopeless. Uh, I share that perspective with you. But you can create the reality in the places where the people live and still more than 50% of the U.S. population, more than 60% of the U.S. population live in cities. And so, you know, you do it that, that way. And then, you know, the, the rest we refer to already as the, as the flyover states, right? The, the part in the middle where apparently not a lot happens. We, we might take a collection of questions. There are three PhD candidates. All right. Who have put their hand Please, I, I'd love to hear from the students. So, uh, we'll, we start with Jingo. She had a hand up first. Yes, please. And then Nick, uh, then we'll come to the So I want to ask you about. Pass the mic. Pussama. I want to ask about equity issues. Because for example, we give the city to hybrid cars. Mm -hmm. We actually like uh, reallocate money from the poor to the rich. Because only rich people buy cars. Mm -hmm. So what do you think of that? <laughs> Could you take three down your questions too? Um, hi, I'm a PhD student here and I'm and my thesis of is actually related to dealing with unknown unknowns and uncertainty in climate change. So uh, when you talk about including uncertainties and unknowns in the production function and in the decisions, I was just wondering uh, what are the challenges in developing countries like India where the resources are and the budgets are constrained to include uh, unknowns which are not, uh, or items which you cannot visibly see right now uh, into some of your decisions, then all you have is you know, that you're operating under constraints. How do you influence policy makers to include these factors which you cannot see or even you know, foresee in the near future? Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, hi, Chris, I'm a PhD student. Um, you referenced earlier the car tax here, the COE. In talking about that and something like the carbon trading scheme, can we be confident that these pricing mechanisms can actually reflect uh, the true environmental risk or impact premium that we should be assigning to these? Because it seems like now those are largely governed by the market and by demand. Um, but is there a way they need to be restructured and more accurately reflect uh, the true impact on the environment in terms of price? All great questions. Let me. Just do one more. Oh, from Nick. Sure, bring bring him on. Bring him on. Mr. Uh, Boxer, so uh, My question is: You mentioned that economists, rather than trying to mend their um, thinking, if they have to get the cops out of this country, they were better off rethinking um, their theories. Uh, do you have the same thoughts with the economic accounting framework? So I'm thinking in particular, some economists are now trying to move towards a green accounting framework. Do you 
Okay. We'll come to the next round after this. Okay. Um, on the equity issues, I'm very sympathetic to that. I see this all the time that we, uh, with all good intentions, uh, subsidize uh, the use of more efficient uh, renewable fuels or more efficient processes uh, by uh, supporting those who can afford them at the expense of those who don't. You gave the example of hybrid cars uh, here. Um, many people are not able to afford a car in the first place and so they are basically uh, subsidizing those who can. Um, the same holds in Germany, which is well known for its very rapid expansion of solar technology. So if you're a private homeowner and you put a solar collector on your roof and you generate electricity and you feed it back into the grid, you can actually, depends on the time of day, you can get more, ener more money for that energy that you put into the grid than when you take money out of the grid. So private homeowners have a lot of incentives to put solar collectors on their roofs and make money on it, right? And through this, Germany now has become the world leader in per capita energy generation from solar. And this is a country that's north of Toronto, basically, right? So they have pushed this very rapidly, but people in cities who don't own their own houses they don't benefit from this, right? It's the homeowners, the apartment owners who benefit. So these subsidies happen all throughout. And so, yes, there is a big environmental or justice implication of this that must be looked at very carefully. Uh, there is also a justice implication of not doing any of these policies, right? So if you do not support the movement towards more efficient and more renewable fuels, uh, it's also the households who uh, uh, are poor who have a larger share of the expenditures go towards energy. So if you don't move away towards renewable fuels, uh, away from the fossil fuels, then you are over the long run increasing the price most likely of the fossil fuels and therefore you increase the drain on the income of the poor as well. And so at the end, you would need to weigh those two environmental justice implications against each other. And the analysis is far from trivial. So I'm very glad to hear you point at that. But so there is a justice implication of the policy action, and then there is a justice implication of non-action. And it's really those two that we need to compare, not just the action against the status quo. Um, the second question that was about the unknown unknowns uh, and the example of India, yeah, I, I fairly quickly admit that what I have said is easier done in places where you have the infrastructure to monitor and enforce and to account and uh, to assess much more carefully than you might have in rapidly developing or in, 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 de in under de less, less developed countries around the world, especially if you're in rural places, it's even more difficult to do so. Data challenges will always be there. But uh, data challenges are always there also in the more developed and industrialized nations. I think what's more important is to begin at the outset, to put in place the mechanisms that can accommodate those insights rather than to use instruments that will not. And by having in place the instruments that accommodate the data, even if you don't have the data yet available, you put also in place an infrastructure through which you can then begin to collect the data. And India, you know, through its, at least its colonial history going back to that point, and if not before, uh, has a very long history of good record keeping on a lot of things uh, because people have thought this was really useful and is still being maintained. And so why not at a critical juncture like this begin to put in place accounting schemes even if the data is not there yet so that when it comes that you can make the better decisions rather than to move ahead with something that we already know is outdated and inadequate for the problems at hand. Uh, carbon trading schemes, <coughs> do they reflect the environmental impacts? No. Um, I was part of putting in place the first and only carbon trading scheme in the United States on um, power plants. Um, in the eastern part of the United States, there are now 
back then were 11, now uh, 10 states are doing this. Is, it's called the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, or for short, REGI. Um, the carbon price there is somewhere around $5 to $7 per ton. Uh, the European carbon trading system now has somewhere around $10 to $14 per ton. That doesn't even come close. Many of the climate models that we use and calculate a so-called cost of social cost of carbon the kinds of models that are being used in the new IPCC report that's being released in just a month and a half or so, two months, um, all pointed typically carbon, social costs of carbon upward of $100 per ton. So uh, the current systems are inadequate and largely driven by the current market dynamics and the current rationale behind those dynamics, many of which you know, go back to the shortcomings that I've sort of laid out in my talk. So uh, we, we need a different approach and then with this we'll no doubt get at very different carbon prices. Uh, but then, again, there is the argument of political will and, uh, and power and leadership to bring this about. And how quickly do you bring it about without hurting but, um, people and the economy, but to do this in a way that we actually have the time to restructure. That's the big challenge. And then uh, the rethinking um, uh, of the accounting, uh, that was the last question. Can you just sort of expand on that a little bit more? I just took sort of very basic notes. I'm not quite clear whether I fully understand what you're trying to get. Sure. So um, you've got to find where the models that economists have created are inadequate and we shouldn't amend them. I was thinking of the way that we account for GDP through the water price. Oh, the green account, yeah. yeah. Some people are trying to amend it and add uh, accounting for the systemologies and things like that. Is mm -hmm. that, uh, in your opinion, an amendment that should be happening? Which no, I think it's, it's definitely a positive. Right now, so the GDP is the market value of marketable goods and services. Lots of stuff is not marketed, has no market value, doesn't count. Contributions of ecosystem to the economy don't count, right? So there's a wetland out there, you pull the parking lot, put a parking lot on it and you charge fees, suddenly that has contribution, right? Previously it made no contribution. So what are we going to do? No contribution, no contribution. Well, we'll put the parking lot out there, maybe a shopping mall or whatever it is, right? And so uh, the green accounting, the satellite accounts that are used to supplement the GDP, absolutely, that's one way to go. Uh, more interesting ones are actually the ones where you not just have the GDP account and sort of the satellite accounts that uh, tell you something about the environment, tell you something about society and so on, but really embed them in each other. So like the... Um, it's called ISEW, the Indicator for Sustainable Economic Welfare, or GPI, the cross, uh, ch the genuine, um, genuine progress indicator, or Bhutan has its happiness index, right? There are fundamentally different way of thinking about what it means to develop an economy. And I think that's really, if you, if you forget everything I've said all day, right? That's the big distinction. Do we want to grow the economy, or do we want to develop? Growth is a sizing, right? It's increasing. Right? It's increasing the throughput of materials, it's amassing the stuff that's inside, but it does not tell us anything about qualitative changes. Real development is qualitative. We right now still use GDP as an indicator of development, which it is not. What we need is through these new accounts, that I mentioned GPI, ISEW, or others. We need an accounting of the actual qualitative change. How much better are you off? How much better do you feel? How much better is society off to deal with the challenges it faces? How much better is the environment off? Right? Those are the kinds of questions. And then the GDP, I don't want to say it, becomes ir it turns to irrelevance, but it's not what it is right now. Right? And we need these new guides for policy making. And it's a little bit of an uphill battle because, as so I with my little you know, retirement account anecdote indicated, we're still really tied to the old model. And what we need is a new one. And, you know, this is why it's so important to have these conversations at universities with all these young and bright people in here, all of you. Uh, so, you know, my hope for my retirement lies with you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we just manage one last that, round of questions. That was, yeah. Start with Mr. Cork. Gentlemen at the back, and then Gopi over here. Thank you, thank you. Uh, professor, fantastic presentation. Uh, at the beginning, I must say that I was lost. Okay, but uh, at the end of it, I come. Uh, quick questions. 
Okay, um, let's see whether I got it right. You mentioned something about the power generator efficiency 43.12. It has not increased. Mm -hmm. That means along the way, nothing actually uh, you know, increased that. And the efficiency of the economy of the US is 2%, but it mm -hmm. increased. Uh, then I saw the pictures of that, uh, you know, the uh, power power plant and the beautiful bungalows, which is yours, I assume. And I said, uh, what I'm trying to look at is that how does things move uh, from the big... I'm looking at what you say just now. The question is, do we want to grow or develop? Grow means big. Develop means small. I, I, I look at that pictures and say whether it is actually something we're looking at big cities or a small town. So mm -hmm. in Singapore, we actually, although we are a city, but we develop it in such a way that the Jurong area is at one side, residential and another side, you know, during the day, everybody to move. We are now looking at a city in a smaller five kilometer way. So I'm just wondering that, you know, maybe the new economy model that you have uh, tried to share with us, does it take into account of reinventing technologies with your new economy models? Uh, thanks very much for that uh, very insightful talk, um, Chris from the Environment Ministry. I want to ask about um, what your what your presentation would have to say for international applications. Say, I'll give Singapore as one example. We have tons of pollution coming from another country, so obviously the costs are borne by, uh, by one country, but the costs are created by another country. Uh, natural source resource depletion is another example where resources could be produced, or natural gas is produced in another country. Uh, we just buy the natural gas. So, um, how could we try to improve the uh, international process at the regional level, at the bilateral level, to try to take these into account? Excellent, yeah. Cool. <coughs> uh, my name is Sophia Mahaki, I'm a school of the Lone Engineer among the faculty. Dodo and my colleague Dodo and I have been pitching for having science literacy, especially uh, entropy and the laws of thermodynamics that are required for the influence of policy students. And, um, demonstrated why it is required for policy um, <clears throat> My question specifically relates to the issue of energy that you demonstrated earlier in your presentation. Um, if we were to go back to our hunting and gathering, I said we would be having this conversation uh, right now. But the problem is we are right now 7 billion in counting. And even, even the most conservative aspects of our event is just that so the question is, uh, how do we uh, solve the problems of energy and food and water for the 10 to 11 million population? We have to rely on energy sources that we suggested would be ideal because, uh, especially the renewable energy sources that we suggested, because they, the rate at which they dissipate energy is very low compared to high density like fossil energy. As an engineer, I can clearly say that the easiest way to solve this problem is to rely on the necessary evil of the energy problems in India. But the problem is they also dissipate energy at a much faster rate. But your solution is to go back to renewables. But the question is, can renewables solve the question of meeting the needs of 10 to 11 billion? Great, so you want me to solve the world's problems here. Then. <coughs> well, I'll try. <laughs> At least I'll try to make a contribution to this. Uh, let me start uh, with the first question about the, the, the observed lack of efficiency improvement. Yes, so we haven't really become ever more efficient. Uh, we have expanded the scope of our operation. You make the case that you know Singapore is now rethinking the way it sort of internally structures itself, right? And I think this is a really important interesting observation with regard to the following. It's, it's a systems perspective, not just a technology perspective, right? So far what we've often done is we observed a problem, we've tried to become more efficient with regard to a particular technology. But really at the end these technologies get used in a social, in a spatial, in a geographic context, right? So if you take a city like like Singapore and the same holds for many other cities around the world, they are now trying to develop more of a neighborhood model to developing, then you, became, then you can begin to develop neighborhood-based power generation, neighborhood-based uh, water and energy uh, and material recycling. You already do new water. There are all kinds of new implications of developing in a different way, right? And so you can have 
efficiency improvements at the process level, but you can also have efficiency improvements at the systems level. Right? And those are the efficiency improvements that we haven't really pushed for. Right? Because so far, the goal was you know, trying to harness economies of scale. Right? And, and that only gets us to a particular point. And now that we have sort of gone down that road and get stuck at 43% you know, for a power plant or 2% you know, second law efficiency for the US economy. Now we recognize this is there's only so much we can push this. Now we step back and take the systems view. Now we begin to think about spatial organization of these things, right? And it's a very different way of thinking about the problem. And, and I know this, this is challenging. And look, let's, and that comes back to the last question of so Snyde comment about solving the world's problem. Well, since the Industrial Revolution, so we're now talking 250 plus years, right? Now we recognize that we've sort of boxed ourselves in. It's not going to happen in five years or in 10 years that we get out of this. But what will need to happen in the next two to five years is that we need to put in place the mechanisms that set us up in a different way so that we can become sustainable, right? And so we are now at a really critical juncture. Climate change is one wake up call. Loss of species diversity is another one. Political frictions and social kinds of challenges are another one, right? And on and on. so there, we're like in the economic global meltdown. Is another. And so all of these keep coming together. And I think we are now at a great place where we can start saying, oh, let's use all the old ways of doing things that got us to this point to try to solve it. Or let's try to be mindful of the constraints and think about it in a different way. And that's where the real challenge is. And that's where universities, where policy schools like this one have a key role to play to think about alternative worldviews, to think about alternative geographies for a city and the technologies that go with this, not just the technologies by themselves, right? And the social structure that goes with this, and the environmental resources, and the waste absorption capacity. You know, now we are at that place where we can ask and where we need to ask these questions. The longer we wait, the more difficult it will be, right? But it's not going to be two years or five years that we solve the problem, but it's going to be two to five years where we need to implement the new trajectory. So that's one answer. Um, international implications of resource depletion. Look, this happens for the United States. This happens for Europe. Let me give you the European example because I know this very well. The Europeans pride themselves in having reduced their carbon emissions per capita more or less like they promised in the Kyoto Protocol. Not. Well, they pride themselves because they account for the carbon emissions that happen inside the European Union. Right? More and more of the emissions are attributable to processes that are happening, production processes that are happening in Malaysia, in India, in Brazil, in China, elsewhere in the world. And so they're importing materials and energy that have been processed elsewhere, and those carbon emissions are not accounted. So what we currently do is carbon accounting on a production basis, not on a consumption basis. If we switch this, suddenly the Europeans wouldn't look so good. Right? As a matter of fact, there's a nice study by Glenn Peters that came out last year, early last year, it was published in the National Academy of Science of the National Academy of the Proceedings. Um, and um, it showed that the emissions uh, since the Kyoto, Kyoto Protocol was ratified in Europe, the emissions of the European countries roughly went up by about 10% rather than down. Not so good. So if you take the consumption-based accounting. So a lot of the Solutions don't come from the accounting, but a lot of the incentives can come when you do the right accounting. And so border adjustments, or so having a high carbon tax internally, and then doing the border adjustments uh, so that you reflect you know, the internal use of resources and the damage that you done out, do outside your own economy um, would be a first step to do this. And there are some discussions in the World Trade Organization on how one does this. It's going to be a big challenge. Um, and then how do you solve the problem of growing human population? Um, we know fossil fuels are finite. Uh, placing our hope on a finite resources, a resource to meet the needs of a growing population doesn't strike me as the right approach. We have 200 and more years of history of investing heavily in the exploitation, in the extraction, in the processing, and the delivery of fossil fuels. Nuclear power, if it were not subsidized, would not be marketable. 
many of the fossil fuels, if they were not heavily subsidized, would not be marketable. Yet, we all have an issue subsidizing non-renewables. Makes no sense. So, why not take away some of the subsidies from those that we know are on the endangered species list? Fossil fuels, nuclear consumption. Right? And put that money to the ones that we know will be available perpetually. Solar, wind, to some extent hydro, geothermal, wave energy from the oceans, you name it. If we begin to transition, then by the time, and this would be sort of the ultimate sustainability criteria, by the time by which we are out of the fossil fuels, we have put in place an infrastructure to provide the energy goods and services, and that's the services part that's really important, that can compensate for the loss, then we're fine. Right now, we're depleting on one side, and we're not building up the infrastructure on the other side. It's not a long-term viable strategy, so there's no way around it. Sorry to say that. Didn't mean to end on such a depressing note. <laughs> but you can also put it the other way around. You can say, hey, there's a business opportunity. You know the other guys are like on their last leg, right? Maybe they have another five years or another 10 years or whatever it is. The, ultimately, the ultimate future will lie somewhere else. Let's go there. Unfortunately, all good things must come to an end. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks very much, Matthias. No, thank you so much. Thank you.